The subject of deliverance ministry has become a hot button issue in the body of Christ today as we've really seen a revival in deliverance ministries all across the nation and around the world. And the question inevitably arises, can a Christian have a demon and how does that play out in the way that we minister to one another? And often there is a divide in the body of Christ on this subject. I think we need to bridge that divide, not by having a bunch of yes men all saying the same thing and everybody retreating to their own corners, but by having a conversation, bringing the body of Christ together. And I think that's what we're going to do tonight. We have many amazing friends who are operating in deliverance ministry and we're thankful for the spotlight they're placing on the power of demonic activity in this nation, how it needs to be addressed. And we also have friends who are bringing a distinction in how Christians are to be ministered to when they are battling demonic attacks. So can a Christian have a demon? Can a Christian be possessed? Is there a difference between possession and demonization? We're going to dive into that and much, much more with our guest who is a tremendous prophetic voice to the body of Christ for more than 20 years. He's been ministering the gospel and he's just released a brand new book, Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker. And I'm telling you, this book is a must read. We're going to provide a link in the description, but he's here to pour into us and share with us what he believes the Bible says about this subject. And I think it's going to set you free. So get ready to share this with as many people as possible. Here he is, David Viga Hernandez. Brother Hernandez, man, it's so good to have you back on Encounter today. Thanks for joining us. Blessing to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's interesting that the conversation of deliverance has become a hot button issue. And I got to tell you, I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful that deliverance is getting back into the mainstream. That it mm -hmm. seemed like for a long time, this subject has been avoided by large portions of the body of Christ. Now it seems like everybody's talking about it. Now, as the body of Christ comes together, I often say it's like bumper cars at a county fair. Sometimes as the streams come together, it can get a little, it can get a little rocky from time to time. But I'm thankful for all of my friends who are diving into this subject of deliverance. And in particular, you've really started to dig into this, not just recently. I mean, this is the subject of your ministry for, I know, the last several years, a, a, a tremendous emphasis on it. But for 20 years of ministry experience, you've been ministering in the subject of deliverance. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. And I want to start with this comment from you. Right out of the gate, you say, if you're spiritually bound, you're mm -hmm. not living the Christian life. Unpack that a little bit for us. Well, first of all, I want to make sure that it's clear that I'm not saying that if you're spiritually bound, you're not a Christian. Uh, I myself, as I share in the book, was suffering from severe demonic attack, not just as a born again believer, mm -hmm. but as a minister of the gospel, I was suffering under the attack of anxiety to the point that I was having daily panic attacks for a long period of time and I couldn't figure out how to overcome that or I would get free maybe for a couple of weeks or a month or so only to find myself back into that bondage again. So I'm not saying that you're not a Christian. I'm saying you're not living the Christian life, meaning you are not accessing what is truly available to you because I think that in Christianity, we've in many parts of Christianity, embraced, I know I did for a while, we embraced this idea that spiritual defeat is just a part of the Christian life. Now, we don't quite word it that way, but in what we do and what we say in other ways, we're revealing that that's actually what we believe. So believers accept some form of spiritual defeat in one form or another as a given or as a sacrifice made unto God or as their cross to bear, or we say things that I say are hidden in religious pride, like but the enemy is attacking me so much and I'm so bound because the enemy knows what a threat I am to his kingdom and therefore he has to focus on me. Not only is this somewhat egocentric, depending upon the motive behind why it's being said, obviously it's a case by case situation, but it also reveals that we don't understand that we were called to live in victory. Now, Christians will have trials, tribulations, tragedies. I'm not saying that everything's going to go perfect all the time. What I am saying is that despite the trials of life, despite the tragedies that we face that could heavily affect us emotionally and mentally, that we should have a spiritual stability in all those things. I mean, Paul, the apostle, uh, shipwrecked, abandoned, rejected, imprisoned, beaten, talked about, lied about, if we get a flat tire, we're saying we're cursed. He went through all of this and still said, despite all these things, I'm blessed. Despite all these things, I'm victorious. Mm. So realizing that outer circumstances do not dictate our inner position, we have to come to terms with the fact that 
spiritual attack is not the same as spiritual bondage. Spiritual attack or wow. even unwelcome circumstances is not the same as a curse. And if we keep thinking in that way, then what we're doing is we're allowing the enemy to use our circumstances to lend credibility to his lies so that if we're suffering or going through a trial, he can say, well, that trial is proof that God's abandoned you or that you're bound mm -hmm. or that you're cursed. When James instructs us that trials are an opportunity to rejoice, to be joyful. Why? Because that's the perfecting of our character. So the idea is that all believers should be, it doesn't mean we are, but we should be the goal, the standard to which we must aspire is liberty where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty now if you're not experiencing that that's what we kind of explore in the book as we talk about the various different strongholds lies of the enemy attacks and strategies but we have to begin on the premise that we should be walking in victory if we grant the premise well you know some spiritual bondage that's just because i'm such a big threat once we grant that premise well now we've already given up so much ground that it's going to be very difficult to find freedom at least permanently so yeah, you beautifully dive into this in your new book, Holy Spirit Bondage Breaker, and the link is in the description of this video. I encourage every single person to get a copy of this book. Get boxes of copies of this book for your church, for your youth ministry, for whatever aspect of ministry you're in. It's going to make a huge difference. So let's let's dive into this a little bit because you get into how you used to believe that a Christian could have a devil and that you've had mm -hmm. a turn as far as how you understand the scripture. As far as that's concerned, you talk about demon possession, demonization versus demon possession. We'll get into all that. But I want to go back to you talking about your battle with anxiety, mm -hmm. because this may surprise people because they see you as being someone who is kind of, are you walking on a cloud, you know, as a minister of the gospel with the anointing, you always seem so composed. Right. They, and so, They see like 45 minutes a week of my life. That's, and that's so it's exactly. easy to assume that that's kind of the way it always is. So talk to us then, give us some details about what this was like. What was it like battling with anxiety? And then how did you break out of it? Well, you know, I believe that the enemy does strategize against people generationally. Mm. This is not to say that I believe in what is traditionally called the generational curse. I didn't write about that in the book, but I want to make sure I'm making a subtle, a subtle distinction. And by the way, with me, you're going to notice I, I'm, I, I not obsessed, but I'm very focused on terminology and describing what I believe in alignment with the scripture, because I think that if we're all using different definitions and terms, yes, it can create for a very confusing conversation. So I'll just say this. I believe the enemy does strategize against people generationally. Now, this does not mean that we are held responsible for our parents' decisions. This does not mean that we can't be free until we uncover some hidden mystery in our lineage. That's not at all how it mm. works. God doesn't hide our freedom behind demonic or ancestral mysteries. However, wow. demons do strategize generationally against believers because of genetics, upbringing, culture, tendencies. He recognizes that what works on the father will likely work on the son because of the same upbringing and the things I just listed. So with my family, there was a very heavy demonic attack. We've always been very spiritual, whether that be good or evil. Um, we've always been very sensitive to the spirit. My great, great grandfather was a very well-known prominent warlock from Zacatecas, Mexico. Now, a lot of people don't know this part of my testimony because I don't often share it. I don't like to glorify demonic power. But I share this just that you might know how dark it was for me so that you're not dismissive with, well, you know, he doesn't ever go through anything, so it shouldn't, it couldn't possibly have been that bad. But it really was. I mean, we're talking that same demonic power that had been invited into our family bloodline, if you will, was strategizing against us generationally. So I believe the same spirits that attacked him or worked through him were attacking me. Now, this does not mean that I was forced to face the consequences of his decisions. As a matter of fact, the only way that generational attack can succeed, the only way you will face the same consequence is if you make similar choices. So it all comes down to you as an individual, you break a curse, if you ever wanna call it that, or you come against generational attack by choosing to live right. It's simple, you live the Christian life. So it gets heavy, it's dark. I was seeing and hearing demonic entities. I wow. was seeing demonic faces in the walls. Um, three o'clock in the morning, there would be a, a, I won't describe them, but there would be beings there whispering over me. And I would hear these voices and it was severe. That followed me all the way up to probably, well, I want to say my preteen years, just that level of torment. Then it became other things like just 
uh, social anxieties and panic disorder and worst case scenario thinking and you know, intrusive thoughts and you, night terrors. It just always was lingering there based on a similar lie, which was that I believed that God wanted to hurt me. And that mm. came from legalism. That's a whole different story. But that was ultimately the lie that I was believing. So it was so severe that I was having panic attacks on a daily basis for long stretches of time. And I was scheduling my day knowing that, okay, if a panic attack happens, I need a route of escape. Oh, I need to be wow. able to drive home. I can't go too far because of this, that, and the other. It was, it was, a, it was a heavy, severe attack. And so... What, what does a panic attack look like, by the way? So when you're, whenever you're feeling oh this and experience this, what, what, how do you know that it's coming on, you know? Well, it varies from individual to individual because we all fear different things, but ultimately you feel what you fear. So for me, it was wow. surrounding this idea of heart anxiety. And this is actually one of the more common forms that panic, panic disorder uh, takes root in the mind. So, for example, I would read an article on a young man, healthy, having a heart attack. And immediately after reading through the article and seeing the symptoms, my physical body would begin to feel those things. You feel mm. what you fear. My arm would go numb. My vision would become tunneled. My breathing would become labored. My mouth would dry up. My heart would begin to race. I would sweat. And I felt just disoriented, disconnected. Add to that this overwhelming sense of dread and this intrusive idea, this almost like this screaming in my mind, you're going to die. You're going to die. This is it. It's happening. And no matter how hard I fought that, like, no, it's the panic disorder again, or no, it's just fear that what if would bring me right back to that place. So it, it was years of that and it was hard to shake. Um, so I thought, okay, this has to be like a demon in me. And this is one of the things that we... Now, earlier, the, the timeline's a little bit complicated because there was a lot of times of study. There was a lot of different types of attacks that came against me. So to simplify, I'll say this. You know, years ago, probably around 2010, 2011, when I finally started digging into the theology of all of this, and that's when I began to discover that Christians can't, quote, be demonized, end quote. But that's a whole different thing I, you said we'll, we'll explore in a it. moment. So yeah. We'll get to that. But so that was one of the thoughts. Okay, is it, is it that? So I would go to the deliverance sessions and, you know, have something cast out and it just wouldn't work. And I thought, okay, if it was a demon, surely it would have left. And it wasn't until I realized that the way I was thinking was contributing to the way I was feeling that I began to look into the scripture and see that reality reflected back at me. And I realized Okay, I'm a born again believer. I'm a son of God. I'm a child of the Most High. I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ. What's the disconnect here? Why, why is it that I can see one reality in Scripture of what I should aspire to, and then I see another reality of what I'm actually living in my everyday life? So that's how bad it was. Well, I, I can't even imagine how many people listening to this right now can relate to that. If it's not dealing with heart issues, the thought of losing your job, the thought of losing your home, the thought of losing your family, how the enemy introduces this is he's, he's, he is very similar in the way he operates in the lives of many people. And I'm sure people, if you've been battling with something like this, I want you to write it in the comments so we can stand in faith with you. We're going to be praying over every single prayer request put in the comments. We don't believe God for total deliverance. So as bad as it had gotten, how did you eventually break through? You, you said you're, you're diving into the scripture. You've had deliverance sessions. You've had it tried to be cast out of you, but you get in the word and, and yes. what happens? Shofars blown over me, oil smeared on my head. <laughs> I went to the revival meetings, the prayer meetings, the worship conferences, the Bible seminars, the everything you name it. Counselors tried to counsel that off of me. Pastors tried to pastor that off of me. Prophets tried to <laughs> prophesy that off of me. I went to the intercessory prayer meetings, I, fasting and praying. And that's the situation of many believers. And so that to me began to strike me first, this, this idea that, wait a minute, that's not in the New Testament. We didn't see believers in that way struggling. Sure, they were persecuted and so forth, but not in that way did we see the New Testament. It, 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 that concept is so it would have been foreign to them, this idea that I'm, I've become a son of God, I'm victorious, I know the Christ, and still you know, I'm battling it in this way. Again, not to say that we don't feel emotions. And, and this is important that people not hear, they, they don't hear what I'm not saying is what I'm trying to communicate because often we hear things and then we kind of project because of our defensiveness what we're hearing. So when people hear me talk like this, immediately they say things like, well, I am struggling. How could you say I'm not? Or I am struggling am I, I, and I am a Christian. How could you say I'm not a Christian? That's not what I'm mm -hmm. saying. What I'm saying is we are not accessing 
we are not accessing all that's available to us as born again believers. So I didn't realize that. To make a long story short, ultimately, I discovered that there was a lie that I was believing that it was at, that was at the root of all these things. And then I looked to the scripture where it talks about strongholds and renewing the mind and thought patterns and think on these things. And what I began to see was that what you think transforms what you feel and do. Hmm. What you feel and do becomes habitual. Those habits become cycles off and on again. Three weeks good, two weeks bad, on and on. Cycles. Those cycles are what we refer to as spiritual bondage. Now, you would be amazed at how much havoc a stronghold could wreak because people think, well, that's just, that's just a thought pattern. That's just a stronghold. There's no way what I'm dealing with is a stronghold. It's much more severe than that. Well, if you're a born again believer, that's what I'm trying to tell you. And if you don't have the correct diagnosis, you can't apply the correct cure. If it is the case that you're dealing with the curse, why haven't you broken it yet? If it is the case that you're dealing with the demonic entity inhabiting your being, very different than it attacking you from the outside, but inhabiting your being, why hasn't it been cast out yet? Hmm. After going several times over and over to the key people through the right sessions with the right methods, everything you're doing, renouncing and so forth, there's nothing wrong with these methods as long as we don't necessarily look to those methods. God moves despite those, not because of them. So ask yourself, why is it then that I'm not free? Well, I'm telling you, it's because you're addressing flesh issues in many instances, not in every instance, but in many instances, you're addressing a flesh issue like it's a demon. We have to learn to address demons as we are to address demons, the flesh as we are to address the flesh. You have two enemies, self and Satan. The way you address a demonic power is by aligning yourself with authority. How do you do that? Live clean, have faith, simple. If you're aligned with that authority, then when you rebuke a demonic power, it's as if Christ himself is rebuking it. Yes. Christ is in power. I am in Christ. Now for the born again believer, it's my contention that you don't have to cast it out, but you do have to rebuke it to cause it to be silent, to stop harassing you. When you look through the scripture, the enemy is called the accuser, the tempter, the liar. These are things that you speak. These are words that he uses. The enemy uses his words against the believer. And so once you've begun to address the demonic, resist the enemy, rebuke the enemy, it's rather simple, not always easy, but it's straightforward. The scripture lays out a very clear roadmap on how to do that. So here's what happens. You resist the enemy, you rebuke the enemy, he goes, but because the problem still persists, you don't think he's gone. Hmm. And you don't realize now that you've got a shift from addressing the demonic attack to now taking care of the thought patterns that were left over from the lies that he told you. So he tells you a lie consistently. Eventually you begin to believe that, internalize that. And now that becomes something you tell yourself. He could go quiet for the next 20 years. And as long as you keep telling yourself that same lie, you're not going to be free. So rebuke and resist, resist the devil and he will flee. Simple. So you resist the devil and we can get into the details of how to resist, how, yes. if you want to, how to rebuke and so forth. The authority, why doesn't it seem to work sometimes? Jesus did say in one point that you should fast and pray if it doesn't obey immediately. That's another thing we can address. Um, but after you've done those things, now, how do you deal with the flesh? Well, you have to look at what you're thinking. You renew the mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's where the Bible says it very clearly there. Transformation comes by the renewing of the mind. So once you renew your mind and you, how shall I say, stubbornly refuse to believe the lies of the enemy and make a commitment that I'm going to stand with the truth, even when my circumstances try to endorse a lie, even when my emotions contradict the truth, even when my own thoughts contradict the truth. I'm going to stubbornly hold to the truths of God's word. And in doing this, you begin to develop a new thought pattern. And these new thought patterns bring forth new actions. And that's what happened for me. I, it all came to a point, and I tell the story in the book, but I had witnessed a horrific car accident. Things were going not so well in the ministry in terms of, well, all the metrics that humans would use for hu based on human reasoning. The ministry by all human understanding was not successful. Um, no one was coming to the events. No one was reading the blogs. No one was reading the books. Our events now, you come three hours early, maybe you'll get a seat. Back then you can come three hours late and pick whatever seat you wanted. You want the front row, take the front <laughs> row. You want the back row, take the back row. So I was very discouraged on the ministry front. I was a newlywed. I was very discouraged because it was difficult to navigate. Marriage is an assault on selfishness. So I'm being confronted <laughs> in all these different areas of my heart and I'm feeling like a failure in my marriage. And so all these different fronts I'm failing on, I witnessed this car accident. 
I reached this peak of just anxiety and depression and hopelessness and emptiness. It was just all in one to the point where you just feel like all your emotions are completely drained, like you have none left, yet you still in a very subtle way feel things. It's very hard to explain, but people who've been there know what that is. Like you feel hollow, like a shell. So I'm there in the hotel room, staring at the ceiling, just done. I was, I was getting ready to preach that night. I didn't want to preach. I didn't want to be there. I just wanted to go home and just sleep. <laughs> and so the Holy Spirit begins to speak to me and he starts to take me down the timeline of my life. He spoke to me about the demonic beings I used to see. He said, do you remember those demonic beings? I said, yes. He said, do you remember um, being afraid in school of the way the kids would treat you? I said, yes. He said, do you remember going to theme parks and the whole day being ruined because you thought you were going to die? I said, yes. And he just like, like almost every age starts taking me through. And what he was showing me was that it was all based on one lie. All those different manifestations of fear based on one lie. And then he said this. He said, why don't you believe that I love you and that I plan to do good things in your life? And I'll tell you, my friend, I, I broke just tears. It was, one of the, it was one of the greatest spiritual epiphanies I had ever experienced. And it was a question. And, and he was questioning the premise of the lie that I believed. Well, that's what the enemy does. He questions the premise of the truth. Did God really say? And if he can get you to question it, then he can get you to contradict it. Then he can get you to fall for the deception. And so I come to this place now where the Holy Spirit's asking me, why don't you believe that I love you? Hmm. I'm thinking intellectually, of course I do. You know, I, greater love hath no man than this. And he laid down his life for his friends. I knew that here, but I had never internalized that truth to the point where all of the different manifestations of the deception under which I was living had been dealt with. And I realized, oh my goodness, it was the same lie this whole time based on legalism, legalism being that I have to earn God's love. And so I was legalistic. And, and, and once I found that truth, that was breakthrough, but I didn't experience freedom until I began to live in the truth. So the breakthrough moment is when you identify the lie. And you go, oh, that's, there it is. And here's what happens. Once you find the lie, you start to realize all the ways that that lie had been affecting you without you even knowing it. Like you will realize, oh my goodness, I did this because of the lie I believed. I did that, or I didn't do this, or I didn't do that because of the lie I believed. And people especially, and this book's not just about anxiety. I mean, we talk about depression. We talk about addiction. We talk about sickness, which is not a stronghold. It's an attack. Um, we, I can go on list confusion, torment, you name it. We, we address it in the book, but ultimately I've noticed that people who identify the lie, they all say the same thing. They start to realize all the ways that lie was affecting them without them even realizing it. Well, it's it, as you, as you lay it out in the book, the real battle is identifying the lie and understanding the truth. So how do we combat that then? Because immediately people, when they, when they want to, when they want to get rid of the lie, they start okay, I'm not going to think about the lie. I'm not going to think about the lie. I'm not going to think about the lie. You know, they're trying to deflect and trying to think about something else. And try, how, how do you battle that victoriously without simply sweeping it under the rug? Right. And, and I, it must be also stated that I'm not saying that you can think positively into freedom. Freedom mm -hmm. is not as simple as positive thinking. That's not at all what I'm advocating here. Rather, what I'm saying is that a new way of thinking will eventually transform the way you behave. And that's yeah, what the scripture says. So, so you want to address it. First, you have to identify it. And that's the difficult part. So you identify it by knowing the word. You identify it by knowing the voice of the Holy Spirit. You identify it by knowing sound teachers. And once you've been given the truth, then you have a standard to which you can measure all different thoughts and philosophies. A lot of times what we want to do is find all the thousands of different lies, write them down and keep a list with us, well, now you're trying to systemize discernment and that leads to more legalism and a burden and even paranoia wow. to the point where you're thinking, well, I thought this thought, does the enemy have a hold of me now? So rather what I'm saying is you take on the truth and you keep the truth. And as long as you keep the truth here, then when a lie comes, you recognize it. Here's, here's, here's a thought for you. A lie doesn't become deception until you believe it. Mm. If someone lies to you and you don't believe them, you're not deceived. Yeah. So the enemy is going to tell you a lie that's believable, often mixed in with truth. Like, for example, with me and legalism, it made sense that I deserved punishment, right? We, we were sinners before Christ saved us. So, of course, that's true. I did deserve hell and punishment. 
But the greater truth was that the grace of God allowed me to become a new creation, standing in Christ Jesus and in his righteousness. And so I didn't connect the dots there. So you have these lies. Okay. You have these lies that come to your mind. I call it creating a filter. You create the filter by knowing the truth. You become familiar with the word, familiar with the voice of the Holy Spirit, familiar with sound teaching. So that when a lie passes through your mind, you're going to catch it now because it's foreign to the new foundation. It's different than the truth. And you say, I have to reject that because it contradicts the word. This is why I tell people, you can't say you're desperate for freedom, but not be in the word. We want freedom to come through the laying on of hands. Just lay hands on me. And that does happen. Don't hear what I'm not saying. That happens. We see it in our services all the time. People get drug addictions and torments and Um, cravings just broken off of them. And it's a very dramatic thing that happens to the believer when they get delivered from these things, the power of God comes on them and everything. But that's not, that's not how you stay free. You see, you stay free through the renewing of your mind through the word. So you, 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 you know the word. And now that you know the word, you have truth to compare it to. So that's number one. You identify the lie through those three means. Next, you have to uproot that lie. How do you do that? Okay. This is something where the how to rarely gets talked about. So I'll, I'll give you an illustration. Let's say I'm trying to form a new pathway in a wild wilderness. It's, it's, it's a jungle, okay? And I'm hacking and slashing a brand new pathway. Well, as I'm hacking and slashing my way through the vines and the foliage and the shrubs, kicking sticks aside and forming a path in the ground, that's going to be a difficult route to take because before the path is formed, I'm meeting a lot of resistance. Now, mm. What will the explorers or the travelers who come after me go through? If I'm building a pathway, then the person who comes behind me is going to take the path that I took. And over time, that path is going to get wider and more clear so that it's very easy to take the route. That's your thoughts. Your thoughts, since you were young, have gone down a certain track and they keep moving down that path. And so you've cleared pathways in your thinking. So it's easier to just go to the negative. It's easier to go to the worst case scenario. It's easier to go to thoughts of unforgiveness. It's easier to go to lustful thoughts. It's easier to allow the enemy to exaggerate his power over you to where you're tormented in the mind with night terrors, hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, borderline schizophrenia, all these things. Now you're creating these paths. So when you begin to try to form a new path, you have a thought that comes. Your first instinct will be to go down that old route. You have to catch yourself before you do that. Now, when you try to form a new way, you're going to look at the old way. I think you go, this is just easier. This new way is harder, which is why most people don't persist in it. But you have to realize whenever you're forming new paths, you're going to be met with resistance. But what eventually happens is this. You fight for that new pathway. Okay. That is controlling the thoughts. That is choosing when the scripture says, think on these things. That's controlling the thoughts. Renewing the mind now is when that vegetation covers that old path. Yes, And that only happens over time if you just stop taking that route. But it's going to take discipline of the mind. Thoughts are the actions of the mind. You can choose your thoughts just like you choose your actions. And so now you begin to do this. Well, how do you form that new path? When a thought comes to your mind and it contradicts the word, you have to choose to believe the truth in that moment by focusing on what the truth says instead of what the lie says. Now, this may seem impossible, especially if you've trained yourself under an old way of thinking, it's going to feel like you have no control over your thoughts. Well, there we go. There's another lie we've identified. The lie that you can't control your thoughts. The lie Mm. that you can't change. The lie that you've tried all of this before. You see, if you're going to defeat a lie, that lie is going to send out backup. And while you're trying to defeat one lie, the enemy throws more lies at you to try to keep you from addressing that lie. That's why you need to be in the word. So this is the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. What's the shield of faith? It's my belief in what God has said. So when that fiery dart comes, which is the lie of the enemy, I raise the shield, the dart is quenched, and then that is my belief in the truth, and the shield holds. And then I use the sword of the Spirit to cut down the liars themselves, using the authority of God's word, using more scripture and truth to speak against it. And this is shield, sword, shield, sword. It's the battle. Believing God, speaking the truth. Believing God, speaking the truth. Deflecting the lie, speaking the truth. And that's why I say spiritual warfare is simply the fight to believe God's truths over the enemy's lies. You look in Ephesians 6. The Bible clearly there tells us that we are given weapons of war, spiritual armor, and using this spiritual armor will give us everything we need to stand against all strategies of the devil. It doesn't say some strategies. So if you put on the armor of God, which is what helps you to stand in truth, then you're going to be able to fight against all strategies of the enemy. 
Wow. And that's why it was such a prominent tactic in your book, put on the armor of God. But what you're talking about is not as flashy as just get somebody <laughs> lay hands on you. Just get somebody lay hands on you and yell, come out and everything's going to be okay. And, and I'm not saying that that's what other people are saying, but I, I am saying that we are seeing a rise, I believe, in demonic possession in our culture around the world it is Absolutely. it is not, not no longer hidden in in a third world country somewhere in some village where where i've been now we're seeing it seems on the nightly news outright demonic possession in front of us and yet there is a difference between deliverance ministry in general and casting out devils not all deliverance ministry is casting out devils and you've right. kind of highlighted that in your book why do you make that distinction between deliverance ministry and casting out devils because if there's no distinction made between deliverance and exorcism, then when I say that Christians don't need exorcism, people hear me say Christians don't, need, don't deliverance. need deliverance. I do wow. believe, to be clear, I do believe Christians need deliverance, yeah. but they need deliverance from that which can actually affect them. The only, really the only type of demonic influence that I say that cannot affect a Christian, and this is based on scripture, I think now we'll get into it, mm -hmm. are, are curses and demonization. Demonization, by the way, is the word possession. And this is actually a topic of debate, but I wanna say this before we get into that. You look historically at any great move, the charismatic movement, the healing movement, uh, the prosperity movement. In its inception, there are always extremes. Yes. And what God begins to do is he begins to balance the extremes and the mm -hmm. more balance that comes, the further those ministries can grow. So I think we're seeing the same thing. And this is not to say that deliverance is just now happening. It's been happening since the days of Christ. You know, we've been seeing deliverance ministry, and it's all a continuation. Healing since Christ, deliverance since Christ, salvation since Christ, pro the prophetic. Uh, that's even further back, you know. So, so this is nothing new, but there are certain times when God will highlight certain graces that are necessary. Yes. And they need to be highlighted for certain seasons. So everything we're seeing about, you know, the enemy is getting very flamboyant about how he's revealing his attacks and yes you're right there is an increase of demonic influence there's no doubt anyone who doubts that just isn't paying attention there's absolutely an increase in demonic influence now the church's response to that is god's grace god is gracing this ministry of deliverance it is the holy spirit's deliverance ministry mm, yes having said that he is going to balance the extremes in order to see it go further spread. Extremes never go mainstream. They just don't. And this is why in the body of Christ, we have to allow for these balances that we might see the fullness of power come upon the church. So I'll say these two extremes here. On one hand, you have apathy toward deliverance, which is people who think that demons can't affect Christians at all. This is not the case. Otherwise, why would the scripture time and time again warn us of such attacks and also give us the equipment necessary to fight against such attacks? So apathy leads you open to attack and ignorance but then there's another extreme and this is religious superstitious paranoia is what i call it and i call it that because that's the side i was on i i haven't talked about this publicly much but i was actually kicked out of a leadership position in a local church because i had become so extreme on deliverance really a lot of people don't know yeah i i had i was kicked out of leadership on i'm telling you and looking back now i can see some of the damage that was done psychologically to a lot of people now, having said that, God did deliver some people. I did see true exorcisms, but God was using me despite my superstitious religious approach, not because of it. And wow. I think that was his grace. It was, it was, we should never mistake God's grace and mercy for God's permission and approval on everything that we do. So yes, mm. there was some, and, 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 and at the beginning moves are a little bit chaotic. They are a little sloppy where there's sure. some form still coming. I don't say that as a criticism, that's every movement. I'm a part of the charismatic movement that's continuing today. When it started, there was some things that had to be worked out, right? So in the same way, I would teach, you know, things like Christians can be possessed and, you know, the demon could be hiding in you without you knowing it. Christians can be cursed because of some ancestral thing that you didn't uncover as if God is folding his arms in heaven saying, sorry, I can't set you free until you get an ancestry.com membership. Go online, take a look and make sure you find out everything that was done in the past. That's just not how it works. So that breeds paranoia. And that type of thinking is itself a form of religious bondage because the people who are under that, A, can never really know if they're actually free. B, will constantly needing 
constantly be needing exorcism after exorcism after exorcism because they're reacting to what they believe is the truth. And of course, this is all done with pure motives. I'm giving the benefit of the doubt there. I think that we should give the benefit of the doubt. Uh, so, so it's not like, you know, one part of the body is against deliverance. Another one is for it. The, I, I, I've never met a pastor who was against deliverance. I, I still, to this day, I have not met one. So when we say things like that, pastors who are against deliverance ministry, I, I, don't, I just don't see that. And I think we have to be careful of, of, of disrupting unity. We have to make sure we're not making divisive statements that create an us against them. You know, we're for deliverance, you're against it. And that's exactly what I did. I'm not speaking against anyone but my former self. That's exactly wow. what I did. I would say things like, well, maybe you need deliverance. Or you haven't <laughs> dealt with spiritual activity the way I have. Or you just need to go deeper. These are the things I would say to people instead of just addressing the actual concerns that they had. So it's not for or against. So every, every true believer is for deliverance ministry. Every man of God I know, every pastor is for deliverance ministry. But what we, what we are not all for is extremes on both ends. We have to be willing to find balance. And in our biblical balance, we find unity. So let's get to this which, idea by the now. Way, which, by the way, I'm, I'm so thankful for the conversation that the body of Christ is having right now in different streams. And it, it is bringing iron sharpening iron. It is bringing Absolutely. tremendous balance and health when we talk about these things where we may differ on these, on these issues. It's so vitally important. And it was so fascinating to read in your book your testimony of being in one extreme or one position, yeah, one belief. And, and like you say, you're not battling what other people are talking about today. You're battling where you were at one point in your life. And so when you're, when you're doing this, what's the difference then between why does it matter? Maybe we should answer that question yeah, first. Why does it matter for Christians, whether they can be possessed or whether they can't be possessed, have a devil, what does have a devil mean? All that stuff. Because once you grant the premise that a Christian can be demon-possessed, you create an entire subculture of Christianity that is not biblical. Now you need more than just walking in the Spirit. Now you need more than just living holy as best you can according to the grace of God. Now you need more than just the regular Christian life. It's Jesus plus. And so the, the, the extreme of that, if you follow that all the way to its logical conclusion, what we should be seeing, if that is true, that Christians can be possessed, then what we should be seeing and what we should accept as normal is every Sunday on rotation, the same believers again and again getting demons cast out of them. Now, people who hold to those extremes might disagree with that they might say well that's not what we're saying and so we have to grant that i know i would have argued that but you have to see that that's the that is the logical natural outcome of such beliefs now yeah. it's also important because there are believers who suffer severely with mental illnesses that are yes in part a demonic attack and yes in part an issue of the flesh who can be very easily manipulated into responding in the way that they need, they need them to respond. So, for example, we talked a little bit about uh, anxiety. Let's just take someone with panic disorder. If I read an article on a heart attack, I would feel all the symptoms and nobody could tell me it wasn't real. I would go sit in the hospital, take the EKG. I would be waiting in the emergency room for appointments I know deep down that I did not need. And so what would happen is I would feel what I feared. So take someone with panic disorder, put them in a service for three hours where they're being told demons can hide in you and you not even know it. That's not even in the Bible, but any demon possession was met with very real and severe symptoms. But you Wait, tell them there's that. no asymptomatic demon possession. No asymptomatic demon possession. And so they sit them in that room and tell them for hours and hours. You could have a demon and not know it. If you watch this, you have a demon. If you listen to that, you have a demon. If you were part of this movement, you had a demon. If this person laid hands on you, you have a demon. And by the way, what you're gonna feel is this, and you start listing symptoms. What are they gonna start feeling? How are they going to respond? Now, that's not the one and only explanation for why Christians manifest sometimes. And I think it's also important to say, I am not saying that people are faking their experiences. Uh, let, let, let's do this. Let me first explain the difference between uh, possession and attack. And then I can explain uh, what we're seeing, because this is always the question that comes up with, why do oh, yeah. I see Christians manifesting? Uh, so we'll get into that in just a moment. So, so this, is, this is where we get into stories versus scripture and demon possession versus demonized 
which is often well, a kind of a difference that people make, and you address this in the book beautifully. Yeah, so, so that word daimonizomai is a New Testament Greek word, and it's used 13 times in the New Testament. In all 13 instances that that word is used, it's describing a demon inhabiting someone and commanding some type of control or inflicting some type of ailment upon that individual. But as we see in scripture, demonization is always control through way of habitation. You look at not only that reference and then the 13 instances you see it, you can see if you look at the 13 references in various different translations, not just the KJV, because a popular uh, misconception is that, oh, well, it was a mistranslation from the KJV. Well, no, you can look at the NLT, the NIV, the KJV, the NASB. There's a whole list of mainstream consensus translations that you can look at that use in every instance of that word, the term demon possessed. Now, why do those translators do that? We have to keep in mind, it's not just one translator working on each project. Each translation of the Bible has numerous scholars working on it. So you can of course find a Bible scholar here or a Bible, Bible scholar there, some anomalies, outliers who will tell you well, actually, you know, sometimes demonization is just describing a demonic influence. You'll find those teachers and I think that we should give the benefit of the doubt and assume that they're being sincere. It's not, uh, we, can, we can question people's doctrines without questioning their motives. So yeah. let's assume yeah. they're being sincere. They, they, that, they truly believe that. I truly believe that. So there's no need to, you know, again, n- never mind with this us against them mentality. Let's just look at what the scripture says. So you look at all 13 of those instances, and then you look at all 13 of those instances in various different translations on which several scholars worked. Each translation was a team of scholars. And you can go look at your Bible right now. Demon possessed every single time, except for the ESV, which I think uses the word oppressed in one of the 13 instances. Now, factor in the the reality that there are some, of course, questions that arise with this, like some common ones I hear. You'll hear, well, well, can a demon even own anything? We understand that God naturally owns everything in a much larger sense, but there are still localized spheres of influence that we call ownership. You and I own things and God holds us responsible for the things that we steward. In the same way, demons have these localized spheres of influence that we call ownership. Of course, accepting the fact that God ultimately is in control and owns all things. But think about this. If a demon inhabits someone and exhibits some control by way of that habitation, We have a term for that. That is called possession, demon possession. Uh, There's this idea, well, Christians can't be possessed. They can't be demonized. That's like saying Christians can't be possessed, but they can't be possessed because you look at the Greek definitions. I've provided this. Maybe we'll give you um, some, a list to pin as a comment on this video. That'd be great. You look at the Greek definitions over and over and over and over to be possessed, to be possessed, to be possessed, to be possessed. You'll find again, one or two that says to be under the power of a demon. But even that phrase to be under the power of a demon is talking about control by way of habitation. And so these phrases that we use, well, you can't be possessed. Christians can't be possessed, but they can still have demons. What depends? What do you mean by have demons? If by have demons, you mean the demon dwells in them and exhibits any control over them by way of that indwelling, you're describing possession. So we can use semantics. We can use different phrases. We can use different words. But ultimately, if you're describing habitation that results in some level of control, that is what is traditionally understood to be demon possession. And that's the word demonized. Now, others might say, well, how can demons... It, this is this is one of the, the questions that comes up, and I think it's actually a really good question because it's philosophical and it's well thought out. And I definitely would have used it uh, years ago, but it's one that many of those who watch my teachings also ask me. They say, so the Holy Spirit is everywhere. If demons cannot dwell where the Holy Spirit dwells, then demons cannot dwell anywhere because the Holy Spirit is everywhere. And this is good, except it fails to take into account the fact that the Bible describes two different expressions of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. One is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, Acts 1-8, Romans 8-9, and then, of course, the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit, Psalm chapter 139, verse 7. So we see there's a distinction in the way that those two operate. This is why when Jesus would walk around with the manifested presence of the Holy Spirit, demons would manifest, and why we don't see demons just manifesting constantly in the omnipresence of God. So the believer has the Holy Spirit in a way that others do not, and it's that indwelling presence. Well, who's to say that that should cancel out demonic influence. Is that biblical? Yes. The scripture asks the question quite 
frankly, when it asks, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Of course, the context being our fellowship with unbelievers, but the takeaway principle with universal application is such that the very nature of light cancels out the very nature of darkness. In other words, the presence of one by definition would mean the absence of the other. And so once we realize, okay, demonization is demon possession, and it's never used to describe any influence in the life of the Christian, nor do we ever see demons being cast out of believers in the New Testament. And that's not just an argument from silence. We should, in fact, see that. The reason it's not an argument from silence is because we should see that if that's truly the reality that we see in Scripture, at least being taught in the epistles. Why? Because that would mean by nature of its teachings that that would be a normal part of a Christian's life and a regular occurrence, and we just don't see it. So once you rule that out, then you're left with, okay, well, now I'm confused. Or some might say, well, that doesn't sit right in my spirit. These are all things I said. And, and we have to realize you're not confused, you're conflicted. You're conflicted between two views, one saying one thing, the other saying the other. And the only way to resolve that conflict is to look to the scripture. And so we see that demon possession is demonization. Demonization is habitation uh, that results in control. By the way, that is ownership. That's why the scholars use the word over and over and over again. There's consensus on this. And the reason we have to call those definitions into question is because without questioning the definition of Scripture, you can't make the case that Christians can be demonized. Okay. But the Bible does talk. Go ahead. No, I don't want to interrupt. I, I'm just, this is fantastic. Uh, the, the question then inevit- inevitably comes up. Uh, Brother David, I, someone will say, I'm, I'm a pastor of a church, and uh, Mr. So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so, a professional businessman who's been in my church for 10 years, he's a strong, upstanding gentleman, a Christian for these many years, known him. Minister So-and-so comes to town, and he starts rolling on the floor, foaming at the mouth, and casts the devil out of him. Um, okay. So my experience tells me that right. Christians can have a devil. What's the, what's the response to that? Well, I want to be careful how I answer this because what I don't want people to hear me doing is being dismissive of their experiences. Yes. And often that's what what people think I'm doing. So when I say, no, you have to interpret your experiences through Scripture, they say, oh, so I didn't experience anything. No, I'm not saying you didn't experience anything. I'm saying you have to describe and understand that experience through the lens of Scripture. So was that demonization or possession? Probably not. It could be several things. There's several explanations for it. One, it could be that you're experiencing a deliverance, which is different than an exorcism. Well, actually, exorcism is a form of deliverance, yes. but it is a, a specific kind of deliverance. You could be delivered from torment. You could be delivered from deception. You could be delivered from a drug addict. I've seen believers delivered from addiction, and they're crying, they're shaking, they're sobbing. It's an emotional experience in the power of God. That's true. Mm. But that's a deliverance, not an exorcism. That's a very intense deliverance, but not an exorcism. And so if we think every deliverance is a demon coming out, then of course, if we see our fellow brothers and sisters getting delivered, we're going to go, oh, so it must have been a demon coming out. Or no, or they could have just been having a very intense experience in God's presence and power. So that's number one. Number two, it could be that they're suffering with the mental illness And that mental illness is agitated and manipulated by the deliverance doctrines that cause such responses, which is why, by the way, I don't tell people they're going to vomit because you're, that's a very, there's a very strong physiological response for the gag reflex. I mean, that is what, I mean, you you could say something that grosses someone out and they gag. So the gag reflex is very sensitive. That's why I'm very leery of that because I'm thinking, ah, come on guys, like, I don't think that's being done intentionally. I, 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 again, love believes all things. I, I think all these things are being done sincerely. And again, I think it's Me important too. to say I have friends who, 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 who I love dearly. We won't, we won't name names because we don't do that. But I have friends that I love dearly and honor and respect. And I would stand with them. You know, if persecution hits the church, I'm standing with them. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be hiding in the bunkers with them. And, and mm-hmm. you know, the, the, if, if someone asks, are they men of God? Are they women of God? Absolutely. 100%. Should we support and them? And they're it? bringing, Absolutely. And they're Absolutely. bringing so much to the conversation. And they're bringing and tons awakening of, the subject. Yes. yes. And, and, and they're doing a lot to bring to the conversation. Um, but, but, but again, this, this is not, but the deliverance ministry isn't owned by one group or one person or one movement. It's, it's the Holy Spirit's deliverance ministry. Wow. And so if it's his, his ministry, we have to make sure that we're receiving from all parts of the body to bring wholeness on this idea. And again, what is extreme cannot go mainstream. 
If you want this to go further, we have to find the biblical grounds for it. So having said that, uh, uh, this is not, again, this is not an attack, and I'm not apologizing for what I'm saying either. I just don't want the people who need to hear this most to be so offended that they don't turn from this. Hmm. And so, you know, in terms of how these attacks look, sometimes we mistake it for being um, uh, an exorcism when it was an intense deliverance. I'm also talking about that mental illness. Uh, you, you know, you say, you know, you're going to vomit or, or out through the mouth. Yeah, that's going to cause them to heave. That's going to, and, and that, I'm not saying that's every instance. Maybe sure. demons do sometimes come out that way. Right. I know I used to teach that adamantly, but to say you need to do that to be delivered, that's the different, that's, that's a different thing. Um, okay, so sometimes it could be a mental illness, OCD, panic disorder, schizophrenia. I've had people in our ministry who serve here today in their right minds who were going around accepting all these and they were so tormented, they were considering suicide. I get, Pastor, I get, I, I, get, I get messages every day from people who tell me they were going to kill themselves, saying, I thought I had a demon. Everywhere I went, they couldn't get it out, or they would get it out, and then it would, quote, come back, end quote. And, oh, it was, wow. and this was years and years and years. I had a woman, it broke my heart. It shattered my heart into pieces. She said, she said that, she said, my brother believed he had a demon, and he went from ministry to ministry, and they just told him they just had to keep praying to get it out, and, and no one told him what was being taught in these teachings. She said, if, if my brother had heard these teachings, he'd be alive today. Mm. And so again, this isn't, this, isn't, this isn't a game. This is why people say, well, why does it matter? Why do you, because there are people who are severely affected by this that are being told something that isn't true. They're having religious burdens placed on them that God never placed on us. So, so we have, of course, that mental illness. The other, it could be that an individual is responding. This is number three now. The individual is responding in a way that they think is necessary for them to be free. So, so far I said it could be an intense deliverance. Yes. So far I said it could be a mental illness. So far I said it could be that the individual is responding in a way that they think is necessary to be free. Um, number four, and this is very rare, but it happens. Some people just act and perform. Um, it happened at one of our services. Someone started doing it. And I discerned by this, but I said, stop that. It's not time for that. I said, you're in the flesh. That's not it. And instantly they were able to stop, which was proof that it wasn't a demon. Now here's how manipulative it gets. If I say that to someone, I say, Hey, knock it off. You're in the flesh. And they stop and they sit down. Someone who believes a Christian can be demon possessed will say, Oh no, no, no. The manifestation stopped because you didn't allow it. And when, when you don't acknowledge that there's possession there, the demons can't manifest. I'm thinking, where's that in the scripture? He said, we have to come up with explanation and then a backup explanation and explanations of our explanations to try to hold to these rather than just been going to the simple truth and saying, it's not something that can happen to believers. Number five, and this is the most controversial one. <laughs> uh, it's that you're not a true born again believer. Now, hmm. I'm not for teaching to respond to itching ears. You'll hear lots of preaching on false conversions, compromising Christians. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? We all believe that there's such a thing as false converts who will yes. stand before God and be shocked that they're not accepted. Yet we can't say that that doctrine applies in the realm of deliverance. Hmm. Why not? Well, because it's an explanation and that explanation is fought because people want to hold to that, that idea. So, so far I've given five explanations, by the way, Again, what I've noticed in experience, so people will hear me saying is, you're saying I'm not a Christian? No, I gave you five different explanations <laughs> for why this could be. Five different, you choose which one it is. Are you mistaking an intense deliverance for exorcism? Is this a mental illness? Um, are you just responding to the pressure of the doctrines or the programming of the doctrines and responding in a way that you think is necessary to be free? Is this an act? Most people, that's not the case. 99% of the time, that's not the case. Or is it possible that you're not a true born again believer? And I found that many people superficially accept Christ, especially people coming in from different systems of belief. They just kind of superficially accept Christ as if they're accepting another power or another, you know, collection to their ideas. And then they manifest and say, well, I'm a Christian. Well, what is a true Christian? And that's the big question, isn't it? But you yeah. know, those five, those are five explanations of why someone could manifest in a church when they claim to be a Christian. Those are five different explanations. Why on earth would we ever reach for the one explanation that contradicts the scripture? So people want to ignore all five of those and go right for the one that says, well, Christians can be possessed. 
I don't understand it. So, well, I do because it was, I'll, I'll say what it is. For me, and this isn't speaking for anybody else, for me, it was that I, I had been taught it and then I just didn't want to admit I was wrong. It was that simple. I just didn't <laughs> want to admit I was wrong. And here's the thing, we got to be very careful of saying things like, well, you're not an expert on this, so you need to go deeper. Because what we're really saying is, unless you agree with me on this, you're not an expert. Or so-and-so says this, so-and-so says that, this book says this, that book says that, that DVD says this, this series, this. We point to all these things. What about what the scripture says? And why is that the standard? You know, the, the, the teachings of man, that should not be the standard. We got to come back to the scripture. And of course, I've been getting a, a lot of um, interesting responses. It's been overwhelmingly positive. I'm getting thousands and thousands of messages since this book came out from Christians and even pastors and leaders who saying this changes the way they're approaching this whole thing. And I've been getting testimony after testimony, people saying after 20 years, 30 years, 15 years, I'm finally free. And I'm thinking, wow. well, there's the proof because I find, and this isn't a statement of insult. This is a statement of reality. I find that the, the, the ones who are most often severely bound are the very ones who believe that the enemy can possess them. Wow. And it's that, that doctrine is keeping people in bondage. And it's, it's sad, and I want to see it, I want to see it corrected. Again, I don't argue against anyone. I, I, I speak for the truth. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is bringing balance to this, bringing correction to that area. And I'm seeing people all over saying, okay, you know what? I did believe that. And you have to ask yourself, where am I getting that from? Am I just yeah. repeating what I was told? Or do I actually see that in scripture? Or am I forcing my interpretation on scripture? And again, I think it just, it's just a matter of we have to humble ourselves before the word. Well, this is only a small portion of the book. And I think this is so hotly contested because number one, ministers, their love for people, their white hot passion to see people set free causes us to kind of collide on these issues a little bit. And two, there's a lot of Christians who feel the oppression and the attack of the enemy so intensely, mm -hmm. it's hard for them to describe it in any other word than, than um, what a lot of people are calling possession because it's so white hot and so intense. So for the Christians, and I know we've got about like five more minutes left with you, for the Christians that are battling with bondage and with the influence of the enemy, how can they get free and walk out of that? Well, first you have to realize you can be attacked demonically. Yes. Again, we've made a distinction now between attack from the exterior and possession, which is the holding of your physical being. Uh, we're talking about the attack of the enemy, where he speaks lies and torments and deception and accusation and confusion and distraction. Those lies are doing more damage than you realize. So as the born again believer filled with the Holy Spirit, a child of the most high God, you've been given authority to speak against the powers of darkness. When you rebuke that demonic power and you speak against it in the name of Jesus, it has to be silent. It has to be. The Bible also says, submit to God, resist the devil and he will flee. And there's a lot more we can go through, but I'll give you this. This is probably, if not one of the most important, if not the most important, one of the most important truths, submission to God. Yeah. Just live right. You would be amazed at how many of your issues would cease to be issues. I'm talking about internally now. If you were in the word daily, you were in prayer, you were in worship, and you were living clean. You walk in the spirit, you're walking in his presence. You walk in his presence, demons cannot swim in the depths of God. They're, they're repelled by that. Mm. And so, right, even as I'm telling you this, there's these thoughts, well, I already tried that, or it's not that simple, or it doesn't work for me. Well, those are lies. And why yes. do you think the enemy is trying to keep you from doing that? Because he knows that's what works. And so I would say, you walk in the spirit, and you'll begin to see these things break off. You'll begin to see these mindsets shift. Again, deal with the demonic aspect. Yes, if they're attacking you, harassing you, you have to rebuke them. Sometimes you may have to fast and pray to get that thing to be silent because your faith wasn't in the place of authority to rebuke it. Sometimes you have to call your friends over to lay hands. It's good to go to revivals, have ministers lay hands. That's okay. As long as you recognize what their limitations are, the demon's limitations are, and then take responsibility for the next aspect of it, which is to cooperate with the Holy Spirit by walking in the Spirit. Would you pray for us now? I, I think people are hungry. They want to be free and they want to walk in the authority 
uh, that you walk in and that people see in the book being taught and laid out before them. Would you pray for us now that these bondages would be broken through the power of the Holy Spirit? Father, in the name of Jesus, Hmm. I come against every demonic attack against your people. And I pray, precious Holy Spirit, that you would deliver that one watching now. I thank you, Lord, that where you are, there is freedom. Holy Spirit, begin to reveal the areas of deception. Speak to them and show them. Father, begin to reveal areas of compromise. I sense the anointing so strong right now. Yes. Like I feel like heat on my hands here. Mm. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. I thank you, Jesus, that your healing virtue is flowing. Deliver your people, I pray. Many of you now are experiencing a peace. That's the Holy Spirit. Receive that now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 If you receive that, write I receive in the comments. And I have to tell you, there's so much more in the book, Holy Spirit, the bondage breaker, the book. What we've talked about is like, I don't know, not even a fourth of what you've put into the book so far. So everybody get a copy of it. Uh, Brother Hernandez, thank you so much for being with us. My joy. And we'll have you back very soon. Every single one of you, share this video. Get it in front of as many people as possible. And let's see the Holy Spirit's power break these bondages in Jesus' name. Do you have a voice that's bursting to be heard or a message that the world needs to hear? If you're a born-again believer, I believe that you do. What if there were some tools that you could get in your hands that would cause you to reach millions for the glory of God? It's time for you to step into the spotlight at the Armed Media Conference this year, August 3rd, 4th, and 5th. You're going to learn how to turn your passion into impact. You're going to learn from powerhouses like Sean Cannell, Omar El Tafori, Gabe Perot, and many more. They have been where you are, and they're going to show you the secrets of their success. We have hacked AMC this year with practical tools and strategies for you to master YouTube, podcasting, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and many other platforms. Dive deep into the art of thumbnails, SEO, vertical video, monetization, artificial intelligence, and how it can help you, and much, much more. Plus, you'll be able to connect with like-minded, spirit-filled believers who are on the same journey as you because you're not just attending a conference, you're joining a community. The Armed Media Conference is where God's vision for your ministry and your business becomes a reality. Space is limited, so visit our website to book your spot now www.armed.media take the first steps toward amplifying your voice and we can't wait to see you there